I think one of the areas that I have underserved is Islamic apologetics, and the reason is obvious. I am from a Christian majority country, and so Islam isn't as much of a threat as Christianity is. However, I still think we should engage with other faiths as much as possible, so I'm going to do just that. I'm going to focus on Islam for this video and respond to some Islamic apologetics. This video is called Atheists Can't Answer These Three Questions, so let's see what these three questions are and find out if we can answer them. Theism, a view that constantly leads you to a dead end while questioning the universe. While everything we see in the universe is actually evidence for accepting the Creator, atheism ignores them. Okay, these are just assertions. I don't think atheism leads you to any kind of a dead end. What atheism does lead you to is, there are things about the universe I don't know that may be fundamentally unknowable, and just because they are unknown and maybe unknowable doesn't mean you have the right to just throw your god in there willy-nilly. But let's continue. We can't talk about it very long, but today we will consider only three questions that atheists cannot answer. Bet I can. Question number one. Where do these characteristics come from? It's an established rule that one cannot give what one doesn't have to another one. For example, let's say there are only 100 white balls in a glass sphere. What is the chance of a red ball to be chosen from this sphere? Of Jesse, what the fuck are you talking about? Of course it's zero, right? No matter how long you wait, you will not get any because there is no red ball inside the sphere anyway. Keep this example in mind. Let's consider a black pencil. Can you draw a rainbow with this pencil? No, because the pencil is in no color other than black. So well, I mean, technically you could draw a black rainbow, couldn't you? Or a rainbow with shades of gray, couldn't you? So naturally, a rainbow cannot be drawn. What I mean is, you cannot give a feature you don't have to someone else. Now, I take a look at the universe, and I see that everything is made of atoms. How okay, so he understands that atoms exist, that's a good start. However, although atoms are ignorant, willless, lifeless, and blind, deaf and numb creatures having no cognitive senses, when they come together and occur to us as a human being, we see that the man made of them carries all these features. So, the basic question... All of what features exactly? But also, he's kind of missing a few steps here, because it's not like there's just atoms free-floating in the universe and they all just coalesce all of a sudden to make a dude. That's not how that works, okay? At the very beginning, the Big Bang, there probably would have only been the single type of matter. And then as stellar evolution happened, uh, cosmic evolution, you know, over a long period of time, you get more and more different elements popping up as a result of stars of various kinds being formed. And over time, that results in a very wide variety of elements in the universe. Now... Thankfully, that happened, and something like, you know, 9 billion years after the Big Bang happened, little solar systems were forming, or should I say stellar systems, star systems were forming. Solar system technically only refers to this system we are in right now around the sun. So star systems, hopefully nitpickers will uh, avoid criticisms there for that. And uh, these star systems have all the ingredients for life around them. We've discovered a bunch of them still forming currently in the universe that have all the elements of life. Turns out water is common. Turns out carbon is common. Turns out amino acids, the building blocks of life, are extremely common. All of these things are common. Uh, planets in the habitable zones of their stars, very uh, common. All of these things we find all throughout the cosmos. So the building blocks formed over billions of years exist in just solar systems galore all over the place, right? And then, eventually, life emerges. How does life emerge? Well, that's a good question. We don't have all the answers, but there are some pretty good educated guesses. You can check out Professor Dave. He's been in a lot of arguments with this, I mean, about this subject, with people about this subject. That's a good place to start. I'm sure Forrest Valkai's done something on it. I'm sure plenty of other people have as well. Uh, I won't dwell on that, but over time, after the first life forms emerged, over billions of years, maybe three billion years, evolution happens from single-celled life forms to multicellular forms of life, on to more, quote-unquote, advanced uh, species. 
and then on and on and on, until today you have modern man. And we can chart the evolution of humanity back into time for millions upon millions of years. I mean, we know, for example, that humans and chimpanzees last shared a common ancestor something like six to nine million years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, gorillas, something like 20 million years ago, 16, I think, to 20 million years ago. And we can just like chart this back over time. We can see the genetic linkages between every other animal in the animal kingdom. We know, thanks to DNA, we have a long record of our evolution and our relation to every other form of life on Earth that we have ever discovered. Plus, we have a stellar um, fossil record with which to corroborate this amazing evidence found in our DNA. So it's not like a human just emerged from a set of atoms. No, no, no. The path to life, to modern man, was long indeed. And everything you are, everything you think of yourself as, all of this personality stuff, it's the result of electrical impulses in the brain. Electrical impulses constantly flowing in various directions throughout the brain, alongside your senses, your, your sense of sight, smell, touch, taste, hearing. These senses and electrical impulses come together to make up what is essentially you. These are emergent properties, something known to happen in nature very frequently, uh, with or without talking about humans in specific. So yes, we have an answer to that question. Let's continue, let's see what else he has. Is, how can atoms give these properties to human beings while they lack all of them, as they cannot be the true sources there must be someone else holding these attributes. Be they can be the true sources. They are the true sources. Where else would these things come from? Nobody came down out of the sky and put me in my mother's womb. I mean, somebody definitely did do that, but it wasn't God. It was my father. And, you know, there was D it was a nasty, messy affair, I assume. Lots of DNA involved. Uh, and we don't want to get into that, obviously. But uh, thanks to that whole disgusting process, uh, nine months later, there was baby me. And over time, baby me learned and developed and grew into this wonderful specimen you see before you today. I was the best mistake that my parents ever made. And uh, believe you me, uh, nobody came down and planted the attributes of me in me. Those developed over time as the result of interaction with my environments, other humans, that sort of thing. So these are emergent properties of me, of the person that I am, and they did not come from a god. They came from first DNA shared between two people that resulted in a baby me, and then over time baby me learned and grew and developed. And, you know, if I were to get, let's say, a traumatic brain injury or to have like a stroke or something like that, all, of, all the things that I am could disappear or change entirely. People have traumatic brain injuries and strokes and they become different people or, or in a real sense, cease to be people at all. This happens. That implies that you are your brain. That's an important thing, I think. Because the atom that cannot see cannot create the seeing eye. The atom that cannot hear cannot make the hearing ear. The atom without life cannot form the human who has life. The These are all assertions. I mean, there is really nothing, I don't think, special separating life from non-life. Uh, I mean, you know, philosophers have been talking about this for just eons and eons and still don't have solid conclusions about really what separates life from non-life. Um, but I don't really think that life is that special overall. Like, I don't think that life is anything other than a combination of chemicals that do things. Just like anything else in the universe. That's essentially what it comes down to. Are we more complex than, like, let's say, a rock? Well, yes, certainly. Uh, are we more complex than, let's say, a nuclear reaction? Well, probably, yes, in some regards. Um, does that make us special and fundamentally different than these things? No, we are made of the same stuff. Whether or not you think we are special in some way, we are made of the same stuff.
A human being has a variety of feelings while Adams don't have any. And all of these things... How do you know Adams uh, don't have any? Have you asked recently? Have you checked up on your Adam friends and been like, hey, do you have any feelings? I doubt you have. Things are repeatedly happening every day, even every second. So isn't it necessary to accept that they are under the command of a creator who has attributes such as knowledge, will, power, life, sight, hearing, and compassion behind these atoms? As we said, you know what? You're right. You have convinced me. God exists, it's a law, and he created me to be an atheist just to respond to videos like this on the internet. So I must serve his will and do exactly that. So I will continue. Sets. One cannot give what one doesn't have to another one. So there must be a creator. Second question. Amazing, amazing, astoundingly stupid logic there, my guy. Who is the judge? Who is the prisoner? If everyone is a soldier, a commander is required. If everyone is a prisoner, a judge is needed. It's a rule that you cannot be the judge and the prisoner at the same time. What does this mean? You know that... A I think there must be some kind of mistranslation happening here. I'm sure this is going to make sense once it's explained, but like... It could be like laid out a lot better. Um, and like, I, I don't want to like fault the guy for this. I'm not even sure if that guy's the one really behind all of this, but like, you know, to me, it's a really impressive thing uh, to learn a different language. I can't uh, speak anything other than English. I can understand spoken Spanish uh, sometimes and, and written Spanish sometimes, but like, I'm monolingual. So whenever somebody knows another language, I find that inherently uh, impressive. I'm impressed by it. Um, if you can speak it, I'm impressed by you. So that's cool. But things do get lost in translation, and I feel like something here is being lost in translation. But let's try to make the best we can out of this situation, because I really do want to answer them honestly. I might make fun of them a little bit, but, you know, I do want to answer. A room cannot be dark and light at the same time, or a paper cannot be dry or wet at the same time. These are some examples confirming that one cannot hold two opposite attributes at the same time, because carrying two attributes opposite to each other is a contradiction. Being a judge and being a prisoner are two opposite states. If you are one of them, it's impossible to be the other. Now, think of a building which is being built with bricks. If you do not accept the architect to build it, it will be a contradiction to accept that bricks are building this on their own. Because Let's just uh, stop for a second because if they see this video by any chance, I mean, this, this channel has like 2 million subs, so I doubt any of them will ever see this, but let's assume they did see this. Simplify your examples a little bit. Try to work on simplifying everything because you got to remember, Americans, I assume that's who they're targeting, maybe people from the UK, but Americans are not that bright. I hate to say it, it's true. Americans are not that bright. Um, following something like this will probably drive the average American to uh, something resembling insanity. So simplify these examples, make them easier to understand. I, 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 now I get what you're getting at, but like, I'm just saying, if you want to reach out to Americans and probably at this point, let's be honest, Canadians, people from the UK, look, we are all getting, uh, we're all losing brain cells in these countries. The microplastics are really getting to us. Please simplify it a little bit. House. In this case, the bricks will be both prisoners and judges of each other at the same time. Since all the bricks have a nature that is the same with each other and have no knowledge and free will, they cannot form a building by coming together and agreeing. Otherwise, it will be a contradiction. Who will give the order? Who will apply the order? A great confusion would show up. They wouldn't be able to establish a system that could stay protected from collapsing at once. So, they are all prisoners and there must be an architect who has an- This is just like the watchmaker argument, but like the the really long-winded version of the watchmaker argument. I'm sure all of you know what that is. But if you don't, it's just something that Christians use. Like, So if you found a watch in a field and nobody else was around, would you think it was natural? And the answer is, well, of course not. But we know how watches are made. We know that humans make watches. We've never seen nature make a watch. We have seen nature make plenty of other things, so that's a pretty big difference. So it's just that argument, just like the long-winded version of it, but let's see if let's see if he ever like completes it. 
an absolute power on them. The judge is the architect and the bricks are his prisoners. Likewise, when we examine the This is a super mixed metaphor, but like, you know, after a point, how many metaphors can you mix? Like he mixes like, like two different metaphors and now he's moving onto the human body. And I really hope he doesn't mix those metaphors with the human body because this is getting like legitimately confusing, even for me. And I'm like, I don't know, I, I think I'm kind of smart, I guess. The human body, we infer that atoms cannot make this system. 350,000 people are born every day. Who is the commander here and who is the applier? If we assume the atoms to be doing this job, which ones among them give orders and which ones follow the orders? How can atoms get along with each other and create so many people every day while they have no knowledge, free will and life? So, just as bricks cannot make the building, atoms cannot agree to carry out a quite complex job. That is to say... Why is this guy itching to give atoms uh, consciousness or agency? No, you are correct. Atoms do not have consciousness or agency. But they don't need to, because nature works in certain ways. There are certain ways nature works that we call laws. These laws determine the bounds of nature. Things can only act in nature within the bounds of these things we call laws. And I just want to clarify, just because there are laws doesn't mean there is a lawgiver. It's just how things work in this universe. But I digress. Things just work as they do in this particular universe because of the way the laws of nature work. Now, each individual atom in my body, in, in, in my hands do not need to understand what I'm about to do. They don't need to understand what's going on here. Let me tell you how this works, okay? So, what is a hand made of? Now, I'm no expert in anatomy, but I think I have the basic idea of it. A hand is made of, you know, bones. You got some bones in there. Really creepy stuff, spooky skeleton. Um, you got some muscles in there. Muscles, uh, also very creepy looking. You got some blood vessels, some blood. You got nerves. You got, I assume, tendons and stuff like that. Uh, you got some joints in there. Really nice stuff. Um, but we have nerves, which I think are probably the most interesting one because there is a nervous system that runs from my brain, which, if you didn't know, is in here. Uh, not in everybody at this point, I assume, but in here for most people. And these nerves run from the brain all over the body, including up into the hands. These nerve impulses determine a lot about what we do. For example, let's say, so I have a candle right here, okay? I have a candle. It's not lit currently. Let's take the top off of my candle. And a big puff of smoke just went out because it was lit uh, earlier. But uh, here's my candle. It's a happy Hanukkah candle, ironically. So I'm not Jewish and a Christian bought it for me. Um, smells really good, really nice stuff. Let's say this candle was lit right now, okay? Let's, let's say I lit this candle, and there is a, a pleasant odor emanating from it. Now let's say that I take this hand, using my nerve impulses and my muscles, and I stick this hand over it. Now, the atoms of my hand, they're probably not going to be carbonized by the flame before they start to heat up, and my nerves send the signal to my brain. This signal is going to say that this is hot. It's going to say that there is hotness happening here. Hotness is increasing, and you should probably move that away. Each individual atom in my hand does not know what's happening. The only thing that's going on here is my brain is detecting that things are changing in the area around my hand, and it's changing in a way that indicates this could get painful very quickly, and that pain is going to make me want to do this hopefully very quickly, because burns can happen very quickly. And that's just a basic idea of how these things work. Now, is that the most scientific explanation? Well, no, I'm not a scientist. Is that the best explanation you'll ever hear? Probably not. Does it serve at least some purpose? I think so, because the point I'm getting at here is the individual atoms don't have to know anything, okay? They don't have to know anything. Because when you get certain atoms together, they create certain structures. 
and uh, and honestly, I mean, proteins are probably more relevant here, but proteins are, of course, made of atoms. So regardless, you get them together, they create certain types of cells with certain types of functions. All of these cells working together do send things like signals to other parts of the body. In nerves, I mean, it's going to go straight to the brain really fast. It's going to tell you if you're in pain, because if it didn't, we would not have survived long enough to evolve to become these creatures that took over the planet. If we were just getting hurt everywhere we went, and without even knowing it, we wouldn't be alive long enough to multiply, to live long and prosper, as it were, if you're into Star Trek. This is a very labyrinthian explanation, I know. But ultimately, we can just go back to the one point that, like, atoms don't have to know what's going on. It's not the individual atoms that make a difference. It's what the atoms themselves create. A bunch of atoms coming together to make up a brain are a big difference from individual atoms just chilling. It's a big difference, and it's all the difference in the world. Atoms are prisoners, and their judge is God, Allah. Just as the same with the architect of the building, the architect of the human being continues to create and keep the human body standing all the time. Question number three. Why okay, before we move on, I mean, I know this is long-winded and silly, but uh, I just want to say, you know, you can get uh, any number of different machines and look at my brain doing the work it does while I'm at any particular task. Let's say I'm just, you know, messing around on my phone, just, just chilling, reading stuff on my phone, doom scrolling, which is what I'll need to do after watching this video. You can like hook me up to a machine, different types of machines, and see how my brain works, how these nerve impulses are working in my brain, how these electrical impulses are working in my brain, what they're doing to it, how the different regions are interacting with each other as I'm doing these very different things with my phone, doom scrolling. You can see this. You know what you can't see in there? The hand of God reaching down to make it happen. What is the real reason? Imagine that we see a train and a baby is pulling this huge train with a rope in his hand. Nobody would believe this, so they would look for a hidden cause behind it, right? Because there are no attributes such as sufficient power, knowledge and will in a baby. No doubt, another resource is required. In fact, we see gaps between causes and effects in the universe. I think you gotta at least hand it to them that, like, they come up with some of the wildest examples that I have ever heard of, of anything, ever. A baby pulling a train, um, is certainly something. That is... wow. Universe every day. While the causes are so simple, the results are extremely complex. The emergence of huge trees from a tiny seed. The emergence of a magnificent peacock from a simple egg. The emergence of a complex human from some simple water show us some examples of the gap between causes and results. So it's necessary to look for another source behind the view. Okay, so when, when we look for this source, how do we look for it? Do we use radio telescopes? Do we use uh, gravitational wave detectors? Do we use uh, regular optical light telescopes? Do we use UV? Do we use infrared? What do we use? to find this source behind everything. Do we use an MRI? Do we use a CT scan? Do we use, what do we use? How do we find this source? Because again, in anything we look at in nature, it looks just like you'd expect it to look if there were no God there, no God controlling it. And you know, no matter how hard we look, we don't see the hand of God reaching down to rearrange atoms or to create nerve impulses in the brain, or to create little new solar systems, or to spur the Big Bang. We don't see that happening. If you're going to suggest that there is a source behind all of these things happening, how do we find it? Where can we see it? What tests do we do to show the source? Because if there is a source interacting with all of these things that makes these things work, you should be able to find it, just like we found the universal laws. If there's something behind these things, where is it? Because atoms lack the required attributes such as knowledge, free will, power and life. So who holds these attributes? Who says that atoms have to hold those attributes in order to be atoms and do what atoms do? No scientist is claiming that. No philosopher is claiming that. You're the only one claiming that, my guy. Not even atheists are claiming that. 
you are, this is what they call straw man argument. He is suggesting that, I guess, these things need to have these certain characteristics that I guess his opponents, atheists, would think that these things have these attributes. And he's just knocking that straw man down with his amazing arguments against it. But nobody's actually saying that. Nobody is saying that, my guy. Doesn't science explain this, you might ask? Yeah, it does. It, science has very good explanations for all of these things. No, science only explains the detail. Oh, well, okay, then no. Uh, yeah, that's an assertion, buddy. You gotta... Come on, get, let's get to it. Let's hear it. ...sequence of the stages of their emergence. For example, they observe that there are some certain stages extending over 28 days inside the egg. Observing the stages doesn't mean that you solve the system and find the answer. We know how these things work. We have a good understanding of these, of how these things... What do you think science is for? Science isn't just about observing things to watch them happen. It's about figuring out what makes them happen. And when it comes to something like a pregnancy, we have great answers for that. We understand the whole process. We get it. There's no mystery there. Observing is just seeing sequences. There are still questions in the mind. How can these atoms form a structure like a peacock? This DNA. Uh, we have explanations for that too. Despite lacking attributes such as knowledge, free will, power and life. An explanation which is based on temporal sequence of events leaves out these questions with no answers. So, as we said in the beginning that a baby cannot pull a train, just like that, another cause appears to our minds behind the scenes due to the gaps between the so-called causes and their effects that we examine in the universe. So so, I'm not convinced. Are you convinced? Let's see what he's about to say about, about how he's about to finish this. Let's see what he does. So, everything we see it tells about Allah, those who... Okay, so how do you know it tells you about Allah? Because every religion out there says that the wonders of creation tell you about the truth of our God. But they can't all be out there. So, which one is it? How do I know? How do I find out? Do I just take your word for it? Because Christians claim the same thing. Should I take their word for it? Whose word should I be taking here? And how do I know that any of you are right about it? What if it's a different God entirely? One that you haven't even thought of yet. One that hasn't even been invented yet. One that just exists out there that doesn't even care about us. How do I know that? See, there's a big gap between proving the need for a God and proving the need for your God. Now, I could see that there could be, for some reason or another, a God could exist. That's not out of the realm of possibility. But even if there were, I don't see why it'd be yours. I don't see how uh, you could convince me that yours is real uh, any more than the Christians can. You both have the same amount of evidence, which is just, you have a book. Great, you have a book. You have a book, the Christians have a book, the Jews have a book, the Hindus have some books. Everybody's got books. They all say, our gods did all this. I'm not buying any of it. Sorry. Who want to find him? We will share this kind of videos, inshallah, about atheism, agnosticism, and deism. So don't forget to subscribe and... Well, I'm glad they didn't forget about deism because uh, let's assume that atheists couldn't answer these three questions and that not answering these three questions pointed to the existence of a god. Um, the deist god would be the obvious choice. However, let's also just say this that if there are three questions atheists can't answer along these lines, if atheists couldn't answer any of these questions, that would not immediately mean atheism is wrong. Uh, because there are plenty of times throughout history that atheists didn't have answers. Like there's a time before we thought of evolution or a time before we thought of the Big Bang. There were certainly lots of times before we actually had solid evidence for those things. But they were there the whole time. Just because we don't have an answer yet doesn't mean the answer isn't out there. And that doesn't mean you have the right to just say, well, since there is no answer, it must be my answer. Wrong. Um, you can't do that. Sorry. Anyway, I'm sorry this is so long. I didn't think it was going to be this long, but I've uh, just had a wild time with this one. So I hope you enjoyed. I hope you have a lovely day, night, evening, whatever it is there. I hope you have a lovely one and a lovely life. Thanks for watching.